recording of July 2nd, 2022, Saturday virtual event of the PCR NMRA Coast Division. Okay, well, welcome. Um, Saturday, July the 2nd. So we've made it to July. We've made it through the year to July. Um, just had three things today. Um, first, I want to just talk a little bit about um, potentially putting together a field trip to the Golden State Railroad Mu Model Railroad Museum um, in August. So we'll talk a little bit about that and what would be good timing and, and dates. Um, and then just kind of general discussion. And then we, I'm actually trying something new, which is um, I've actually engaged with uh, just about everybody who did a clinic at the PCR convention about the potential of them redoing their clinics for us. Um, and David and I have been talking to them and setting that up. And so hopefully uh, we're, I will have some responses. I think we've had four of the clinicians respond so far. So that hopefully should mean that over the next couple of months, we'll have a number of clinics scheduled. And my kind of plan is to have our meetings do any discussions up front um, and then have the clinic at the end of that discussion after about a half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, does that make sense to everyone as far as doing some clinics? Good, thumbs up, thumbs down, cool. Um, so today I'm going to do one taught the, what are the two clinics I did? This one is, uh, kind of a bit of an evolution of design as well as kind of modeling interest around, um, moving from being kind of what I'll call, um, totally imagined to much more prototypically focused, uh, modeling. Um, so we'll, we'll do that a little bit this after today. And then, um, hopefully, I, I think I'm, we've got something lined up for a couple of weeks from now for a, a nice clinic at that point. So the first thing I wanted to talk about today is um, uh, the potential of going to the Golden State Model Railroad Museum. And uh, David, why don't you go ahead and, and tell us you've had uh, some conversations about that and kind of the thought process. Larry Osorio uh, is active in that organization, and I think it's the HO side, but he said that he approached people at the museum and they thought they indicated interest in having us come to visit. And um, I'll have to work with Larry tomorrow to work out details, but largely it's uh, what day of the week, what we, what uh, days would people find they'd be free to be able to go down or up as the direction may be to uh, Richmond to see the layout and see how they're doing, what progress they've been making on their N HO and O scale layouts. Anybody have any uh, well, days uh, or such they have in mind? For example, is Saturdays find, or? Yes. I think you're going to find the working crowd wants the weekend. So, yep. I mean, a lot of us are available during the week, but I think that most people are going to want the weekend. Okay. No. Yeah, I think a weekend probably would make sense if if we can schedule that. Maybe we can do something fairly you know, earlier in the morning. That that you know maybe something at ten ish or something like that. Okay. Yeah, I Is would that... vote for ten ish, and that way you still have the afternoon to do something. Yeah. All right. Well, the other thing, the other thing I'd like to do is if we're going to do it once we schedule a date, is to to basically put a little bit of a call out for open layouts in the afternoon. I mean, I, I really like the idea of doing something in the morning, like 10 to 12, um, be at the museum, have some a tour, do some discussions. Um, then we can think about, you know, having some sort of lunch opportunity and then maybe try to have a couple of layouts open up in that area in the afternoon. I don't know if that, does that kind of fit as an, an interesting little day? Yes. Be great if it can work. Yep. I'd go for that. So, of course, the first question then is we need leads on anyone who's up in that, you know, the Richmond area that has a layout that would be interested in being open. So, uh, um, folks, hmm. can't get him to open it, but uh, Tony Thompson's in Berkeley. So, I think, I think. For, uh, there, there, Phil, I think you're going to need to send send something out to the, the the gang broadly and say who who's in the area of Richmond that might be interested in being open in the afternoon yep. for some guests. Well, 
so suggestion on dates um i think it's probably a better a good idea to stay off of the national convention dates which are the saturdays that are the 7th and the 13th um in case folks want to go to the are going to the national or 6th and the 13th so the 20th might be of august might be a great date to pick or the 20 uh, or the 21st on any of the saturdays in august i'm scheduled to uh, uh, operate the Moffett Field Historical Museum layout the first three Saturdays and then ha help a fellow with a John Abaticola uh, video on the last weekend of August. So you are, that was the, so the 21st is out for you, sir? Uh, no, the, the Sunday is okay, but the last weekend, 20. 28, yeah. 17, I, 8, I think GSRM has yeah. their, um, layout open for fee on sundays uh they they charge yeah and and talking to larry i think I'll, I'll have to double check with him but i think that saturday from what he could see would be better because of the open house but let me my recollection isn't perfect on that whether uh, he uh, would find out which they would prefer on a saturday or sunday so i need to get yeah, together yeah. with larry the yeah, they're other all... thing about uh, about the golden um, those guys is that it has to be work for them because they need a bunch of people to if they're going to really run the whole layout for a tour. You well, know, so I mean, we've got five layouts or four layouts in there. They're open from noon to five on Sundays. Mm. Would it would it make sense to to think about coming earlier on a Sunday before they're open to the public. Well, and, and, and David, we'll let you talk, discuss that with Larry, but you yeah. know, that might be the other option would be to do a Sunday. If they open to the public at noon, we could again do something from 10 to noon for us. And then people could stay longer if they wanted to after they open to the public, but that would give a couple of hours for some, you know, focus tours, so we could potentially do something where each of the each of the scales would do a you know half hour tour kind of thing for those that were interested. And if we did them in parallel, a couple of them we could people could move and do different parts of the layout separately. Yeah, if if the if there are folks from the different groups available, uh, again, I need to get more details from Larry. But what I'm getting right now is we're looking at 2021 August but we have to see what they are comfortable with hosting us yep. and you know what what they expect of us uh, so let me let me get back with Larry but that gives me something to focus on here super and super. Uh, we'll see whether they can have people be in at 10 there's just a lot of details here but the, the, having a weekend to focus on then what I'll do is I'll come back to you Phil and then we can spread the word on on what is workable. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, if it just keep in mind, uh, Dave. Yes, sir. Just keep in mind if they want uh, some kind of, you know, if if we're going to cut into their admission fees or if they would like to raise a little money for us, I'll I've got a bunch of stuff that I'm planning on thinking about donating to them. And I'll make that donation if that would grease the skids, so to speak, for us to do the tour there. All right. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so one other topic I didn't put on the agenda. Earl is on. Um, Earl, um, I don't know who persuaded whom here, but Earl and I have agreed to co-chair the 2024 convention. Um, so if anyone is interested in discussing um, roles at the convention, we definitely, you know, one of the real changes that's happened is folks who were involved in the past, a lot of the uh, number are not probably going to be that involved in the future. So um, obviously looking for some new folks to do things. Um, we're looking at potentially using the same facility in Concord. Um, but I'm actually going to check a couple of other facilities as well and see other hotels and see 
Um, if there's any other options that are worth considering or are better from a cost perspective to consider. But um, so that planning is going on. And if you're interested, um, send Earl or myself an email and say, hey, I'm interested. And we'll probably start having some committee meetings here later in the summer, early fall. So early comments? No, I think that sums it up. We've got to get the venue figured out, then we can really move forward. Yep, exactly. So, uh, but we want it, we need to get going, get planning on it because it's, it's time to, to get moving. So, um, I'll certainly they, vote for Concord. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it's, well, kind of the logic was to replicate what got canceled because since that was the convention, we completely lost. It didn't even have a chance to go virtual. Um, kind of the first view was to look at where we were doing it and plan on doing it again. Um, However, if, if it turns out that that doesn't work out and there's a better facility somewhere else, the, the big challenge is making sure that we don't get tied into a commitment of hotel nights that's beyond our capability to cover. So um, that's gonna be a biggie. Um, so that was really, I think those were really the only formal discussion things I had. I don't know, is there anything else that anyone would like to bring up formally? I must confess i'm going to need to grow myself in um, the role of committee chairman because i need to find build uh, more rapport with the membership to so i can pester them and say hey would you like to do a clinic at one of our zoom meetings or when it comes to it to say hey we're needing folks for clinics for the convention coming up in um, 2004 2024 and um, I'll just just indicating I'm aware I need to to up my game on that, and I'll appreciate anybody's help or uh, printable advice, or at least physically uh, possible advice, <laughs> yep. on on how to do a better job in in fulfilling the role. I've had a lot of family stuff that's uh, and stuff here around the house that's been hitting me, um, but hopefully that will settle down in the next. Oh, please, in the next four to six weeks, and then I'll be uh, more able to do stuff. And and by the way, we are looking very much for clinic um, topics, volunteers for September 25th um, in the South Bay at the uh, at the uh, South Bay Historical Society. So if um, if you have something you'd be interested in doing. One of the things we've talked about is doing some out, an outdoor clinic. Um, I think talked about doing one on doing trees. I think that's something that could be outdoors. It actually works out better if it's outdoors because you're spray painting and dipping and dropping and other stuff. Um, so my thought was to bring a couple of 10 by 10 pop-ups and do a couple of pop-ups in the parking lot and set up an outdoor clinic room undercover in the parking lot. So if you've got a... If someone has a clinic they're interested in doing, or you know someone who has a clinic that they're interested in doing that's more scenery oriented, um, there's actually one guy I'd li love to have do a clinic on rocks, but he hasn't agreed to it yet. Um, but if you, anyone has one like that, let David know, because we can probably, we'll probably be able to schedule at least a couple of clinics like that, the one on trees and maybe one on something else. You know, it could be a painting clinic, could be a, you know, a rock casting clinic could be a resin clinic, anything that would be better done outdoors and we can have it under cover so it's in shade. Um, we need a total of six, is that right? You're yeah, well, we, we, we have two spaces indoors. And so if we do two clinics indoors, if we do two clinics in each of those two spaces indoors, that's four clinics. And then we could potentially do two more outdoors. Um, I don't know that we want to try to do three clinics in a row. I think that may be a little ambitious for this first shot. Um, so I think six, you know, either four or six. Right now we're planning on doing one of the outdoors. So four indoor and two outdoor. Yeah. Uh, Phil, just be sure that the location is not windy. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. And it could be windy and it, it, hopefully it's the morning. And, you know, a, a September morning hopefully won't be too windy. So yeah. that's life. If it is, we'll have windblown trees. 
Yeah. So, so by the way, the tree thing we're trying to do is basically um, use the, uh, and I'm going to pull a blank on the, uh, on their last name, but the, uh, the brothers tree machine where you use the wire wrapping with, with hemp and go through making some of those and do a demo of that, have people try that. Um, I bought one of those and I've got it and it could be available if people wanted to have, you know, at, a, at a, a meet in the future, we could have it set up where people could make their own tree armatures and take them home with them for trees they wanted to make. Um, and then I thought I'd go through the steps that I used for the tree that's behind me here in the picture, which is a wire wrapped um, with latex caulk and sawdust, et cetera, et cetera, to try to get a kind of high resolution foreground tree. So, brother, anything's better than wooden scenics. <laughs> so, so you that, haven't that, seen my scenery <laughs> again. <laughs> so that continues to be kind of a focus. So, um, with that, um, and, and by the way, just as an FYI, if I start flagging, I, I am in the. I guess this is now my seventh day of COVID. So, um. It's uh, yeah, I went, I, I made the mistake. I went to Florida for a convention and it turns out that's actually more stupid than I thought it was. Um, oh, well, life in the big city. The good news, the good news is that if you're over 65, you immediately qualify for Remzevir, which is the, uh, the antiviral. It's a five day, 10 treatment antiviral. And that seemed to help a lot. Um, in terms of knocking it out, so. Well, the but, treatment still didn't really work because you still look like Ed Phil Edholm. Yeah, I know. I was hopeful. I was hopeful. It was, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, jeez. I, I was hoping I'd look. I'd look at least twenty years younger afterwards, but that didn't happen. So. No. Nope. No. Nope. But. The good news is able to breathe and everything. So that's the good side of things. Yes. So I guess we'll so, throw it open so to anyone. Open throw it open. Anyone have anything interesting they've been working on this last week? No, I'm not um, anything working exactly. Just uh, following up on the September uh, 25th meeting, uh, the Cal Central Club might be available to be open for that because we're just down the road a yep. couple of miles from the other club. And uh, we haven't had a business meeting last month. We have one scheduled for next Saturday. Uh, I can firm it up then, but I really don't think there'll be a problem. I think we probably could have our uh, club open uh, for that uh, uh, week also. We could, that would be great. Stay. That would be great. Let, let me go. Brian Booth has been kind of coordinating that. I mean, one of the things we need to do is we do need to recruit. Uh, Brian has been doing it, but I think he'd prefer to move away over time. So it would be great if if someone wanted to step up to uh, be a layout, open layout coordinator. Um, and that probably is a role that quite frankly, I'd suggest is, I, I'd actually suggest is probably a two year role. Um, kind of like David is doing, do both that role for the next couple of years for our, our little meets and things, but then also begin to put things together for the convention. Um, and what we're doing is by the way, in all of these, we're trying to build a database um, we've got that stored in a Google Drive and we're going to build a database of layouts that that could be open. So the other thing is that, yeah, if there's anyone who, you know, if you have or you know of someone that's got a layout that's open, contact them and talk to them about potentially being open for that or at least letting us know so you can be on the agenda for the future. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Don. Appreciate it. Of course. Remember too that if you take up that role, if I'm not mistaken, it goes towards uh, the volunteer achievement yep. for if somebody's ambitious and shooting for MMR. Absolutely. Of course, I'm up to the point where I'm at SMR, which is sort of model railroader. <laughs> Let's see. All right, so. And I have to admit, I didn't do any modeling in the last couple of weeks. I was, like I said, traveling and just wiped out for the last few days. I'm busy building a 10 by 20, 10 by 10 by 12 foot metal storage shed. Unfortunately, it's not for a model railroad. 
It's so that we can get the stuff that we want to keep out of the large storage locker. My wife and I have been renting. They've increased the rent to $800 a month now. Mm -hmm. And we've been burgled for the second time a few weeks ago. And so we're going to get out of there. But it's been busy. We go down to the storage locker, pick stuff up to take to donation or the trash and move stuff to the house. But I'm busy building that shed. But again, it's not for trains. So that's that's the sad part. I've got a current working on my workbench uh, project, which is cool. a. Um, oh, I've got this reversed, so you you're going to have to bear with me. This is a uh, repaint and redecal for a uh, Bricks um, Union Pacific automobile car, an A fifty dash sixteen. Uh, that was incorrectly lettered when it came by tricks and so forth. Um, and it's about a 15 year old model that I found on uh, I, uh, on a on a on a, um, a market site, not not eBay. Um, and it was it's a very good model. It's, it's, it's but but it, it's unfortunately the paint scheme was was bad. So that's my work. Now, when, when I got a question for you there. Now, you said an automobile car. Was that automobile parts or whole automobiles? Uh, they were originally, up until the, about 1952, any double-door car, box car, was considered an automobile car. It was just an AAR classification. Oh. But... Um, they were used uh, originally. They were used for full automobiles. This one was was had Evans loaders and everything, and that's one of the things that I'm I'm working on is trying to find the exact location of the cylinders for chains that went down through the floor and are visible underneath the car. Uh, I'm trying to find those exact locations so I can model them on the underframe. I had to rebuild the underframe completely. Um, that's an Evans loader. Hmm. What's an, you said Evans loader? Yeah, um, E-V-A-N-S. Um, they were a company that built all of these racks and uh, a whole line of racks that went inside uh, automobile cars so that you could squeeze four cars into a 40-foot car. Hmm. Four hmm. automobiles into a 40-foot car. The one on top and uh, below on either side of the door. Um, it's it's quite an interesting uh, thing, and it, it, it the the movement of automobiles um, died out after World War II uh, in box cars anyway, um, yeah. and went to um, uh, the box cars that were automobile cars actually became auto parts for the most right. part. They were running in captive service, usually between assembly plants and uh, Detroit or, or Michigan, wherever the parts were manufactured. Um, in California, there were several of these assembly plants in the East Bay, uh, where Tesla is now was originally an assembly plant, I think for GM or Somebody. Yeah, GM GM was in Fremont and Ford was in Milpitas. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's actually one of those really interesting things because if you look at this, it's one of those technology and labor reduction. Right. Yeah. So if you think about it, back in the 40s and into the early 50s, the way that you 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 ship bought cars, automobiles on rail was they were parallel parked in boxcars. And then the Evans Company, they, they had a whole bunch of things about how they tilted cars up sideways to put more in, or they lifted them and that. And but it was a very labor-intensive activity. Um, and then you know, starting in the I I think the late mid to late fifties, they had this concept of loading the cars, driving them on, from the end. And then of course somebody created the idea of the ramp between the cars. And then they had the multiple levels. And, you know, I worked at Fremont and I owned the railroad at one time at the GM assembly plant in Fremont. And we had a loader and it loaded. Basically what it was, was a ramp that was probably about 100 feet long 
that had huge cylinders that would lift it up and down and it would align the ramp to the right level in the cars. And the way they would load the rail cars was they would have a whole bunch of cars lined up in rows. So if you had, if you were loading 10 cars and each one would hold 10 rail cars and each one would hold, you know, five or six cars, they would have three or four rows of 60 cars. And what they do is have vans and the vans would take the drivers from the rail cars, drive them back over to these lines of cars. They'd all get out and they'd drive them as a row onto the rail car. And then they would move the ramp to the next level while they were being driven back to the next row of cars and they would drive them in. And they would load 10 cars in probably less than 30 minutes. And what was actually interesting was those guys would get up to about 40 to 45 miles an hour when they entered the rail cars. And you'd watch these cars get air in the first car as they drove down. And then they'd drive down the cars just at incredible speeds. And that was how they loaded them. And it would, it, they went from something that probably took, you know, what, 20 minutes to load a car, half an hour to load two cars into a box car, to now in the same amount of time loading a whole train. So the, 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 whole, the whole key to that was was the um, uh, increase in the height yep. that was allowed east of the Mississippi ah. when, when some of the clearances were, were, were fixed. They weren't all fixed. That's why you had two two level auto cars and you also had three level auto cars. Yep. And I'm currently looking at an article in Interesting Engineering's website titled Meet Vertipak, the coolest automobile transport ever. <laughs> this 1970s rail car designed for the Chevrolet Vega was an incredible feat of transportation engineering. It's sort of a whacked out center beam with flip out ramps on both sides that right. drove yeah. the car up on the ramps. And I uh, made an Amboy kit of that. Did I think you? It was a wood kit. Yeah, but I think if you search for Meet Vertipak, you will see a pit they show a picture of an, a southern pacific vertipack car being loaded and yeah. it's just insane yeah is i think phil is what you said is they were uh desperate to reduce the costs the same article has a picture of the cars that preceded our current uh auto racks where the yep. cars were open and um if I'm not mistaken, guys, am I correct in my understanding that we went to the enclosed auto racks due to vandalism damage? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Vandalism and uh, uh, people trying to ride the auto cars and things like that. Right. So, but the, the Vertipak, I, I, in the 1970s, when that first came out, um, there was a, a wood pit that uh, I built, the thing is, it's is like almost a no-scale size car in, mm. in, in HO. Wasn't there uh, an example, one of those at the uh, prototype, uh, the area prototype uh, tables? Uh, I thought I saw it, it was, uh, Okay, no, I'm sorry, I'm mistaken. There was a example of vertical auto frames, pre-assembled auto frames stacked hmm. in, a, in a gondola. That's what I saw. All right. Yeah, that I've seen people do loads for that, and I think there was actually somebody who made loads uh, in HO for that. Uh, the 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 gondola full of, of auto uh, racks, but they didn't come to the, the all the way across the country that way. I mean, it, it, they, it was mostly internal in, 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 in the auto parts area around uh, Detroit and Michigan and, and Indiana. Uh, you know, it was interesting. I had a friend who worked at the uh, at GM at the headquarters and probably about this is probably about 82 and they did a big analysis and because if you think about it if you've got an assembly plant in Fremont you've got essentially an eight-day train queue um, back to the plants in the Midwest of parts coming out 
to the plant in California. So you've got this huge inventory on the rails. And if you think about it, it's a FIFO, right? So you're putting parts in over here and you're taking parts over out and it's this transportation queue that goes across the country. And that created huge issues, both in terms of the cost of the inventory, but also in terms of any issues that happened, you know, a derailment, a derailment in Utah that delayed a train by a day would potentially mean the plants were running out of parts. Um, and I remember there were two Learjets on, on call to deliver parts to Fremont from Detroit. And they would literally fly transmissions in a plane because it was cheaper to do that and keep the plant running than have the plant shut down. Um, so when they did this analysis, what they did was a big operations research analysis. They looked at the distance to carry cars, which by the 82, you were into auto racks, versus the distance to transport the parts. And the conclusion was that you should never build an assembly plant farther than 600 miles from Detroit. Um, you know, by, they built plants in, in Mexico, but that was driven by labor cost differentials. But assuming you were building a plant in the U.S., there was this kind of idealized difference where you balance the cost of transport of the finished vehicles versus the cost of transport of the parts and maintenance of the parts um, transport queue getting to it. So it's really interesting of, of kind of how the change in the auto, auto racks impacted building plants where they built plants in California because it was so expensive to ship cars in the 50s. By the time you got to the 90s, it was a lot cheaper to build the cars back towards the Midwest and ship the completed cars than to run a plant in California. So Also, they'd lost the markets in California to, to Japan and, and Korea. Yeah, that, that was the other thing. Was I, I, there was one point I looked at where we were shipping cars to from Fremont, and it turned out um, like a third of the cars were shipping back towards the Midwest. Mm -hmm. you know, you're building cars in Fremont and shipping them to Kansas, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, that it, the, the only thing is that it, it wound up with a huge plant for Tesla to buy. That's true. <laughs> Very generous of them. Yeah, I see someone mentioned the Vega was designed for vertical shipping. I yep. say more so than for horizontal travel on the highway. Yeah. Um, I, you speaking of of of, of um, uh, presentations, maybe I should get something together on on automobiles, cars. That, that would be good. Be a great. Be a uh, good clinic. Yeah, I what I mean up to the fifties when they were still box cars. <laughs> so the thing is. I'm still trying to get my head around this. So the thing is, you had this these Evans racks that were permanently in the car, and they would bring the yes. automobiles in, lift them up with a some sort of lifting mechanism, and then roll them into the upper. Yeah, chains yeah. and guys, uh, labor was cheap then. Yeah, yeah. Well, I That's... think they'd roll one onto a lift and lift it up, and then drive another one underneath um... it and park it. Yeah. I'll send you some 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 diagrams and so forth. All right. Uh, for that, Evans in the night, mid fifties came out with the original open loader, which um, had like four cars on a, on a on a forty foot flat car, but it was an open for a structure that fit on the flat car, and you drive the cars on uh, the predecessor to the eighty six foot uh, things, and. The thing about it is, when you when you ever looked for Evans auto loader on um, uh, Google or whatever, all you wind up was thousands of entries for a Lionel copy. Uh. <laughs> hmm. um, by the way, I'll I'll post in chat um, uh, John at TSG. The multimedia just uh, released a video of his interview with Bob Brown. Looks really, I've only seen a few minutes of it, but uh, I'm really looking forward to finishing that. Um, uh, one other thing. Um, Bob Brown's still going, which is just terrific. Yeah, you know, he's 
still putting out every other month the the Narragansett Short Line Gazette. Yeah, he's he's calling his shots as to how much he does and how much he has some other editors doing, which is really really cool for retirement. Yeah, <laughs> he does does the stuff he wants to do. <laughs> um, I have a couple emails into him about um, actually about this Hercules thing that uh, I've been working on for, you know, whatever, six months. About two months ago, I burned burned out on it. I wasn't getting anywhere further on uh, research, uh, research in the Hercules powder company in detail on their, on their uh, railroad stuff. So it's, it's kind of on the back burner. But uh, a month ago, I was looking at looking at the model and looking at the, uh, the prototype up close, and I remember when I was um, designing the model. You know, looking close, I could see ri little rivets here and there, just sheet metal, <clears throat> sheet metal rivets. But when I was designing it and looking at it, I was thinking, you know, I want it to look more like a locomotive, and it, and I put bigger, more industrial-looking rivets on it. <laughs> uh, about a month ago, I kind of changed my mind on that. And so, I, I mean, I don't have photos yet, but uh, I redid uh, some of the pieces. I don't know that you'd even be able to see them, but there's no rivets on these. And I may, I may just because those little sheet metal rivets, almost like, I mean, they're bigger than pop rivets. They wouldn't be visible, but I'm going to... Uh, make another copy with with minimal uh, rivets. And you see, there's, there's no rivets along the tops, no rivets up and down the side and around the windows. They kind of made it look like a something heavier than it than it really was. Uh, one thing I've done for that type of rivets in the past is um, I've painted like a dark dot and then I paint the same color that's like the you know the, the metal color of the rest of the chassis right in the middle of that just leaving a little black outline hmm. and it looks really good that way and it's very flat so it looks like it looks like a you know like a rivet that's you know one of those inset rivets that's you know designed yeah. to leave a flat uh, yeah know. so just a dark dot of like enamel under under your final coat yeah well, if I can get my hand steady enough. Yeah. That yeah. Is that problem sometimes. Yeah. It's the kind of critter that Bob Brown loves. Yeah, you know, I've, I've, e I've emailed him twice. And I think I know that he's behind a, like an iron curtain where they are protecting him from too many emails. Um, and I, because I had the first answer from that, I sent it with Bob's address and someone else answered it with, really no good no information no good information um so i tried it tried again i i i saw him during uh o scale west and i just forgot to mention it we were, we were talking about so much other stuff i forgot to mention the hercules but eventually uh if he's interested he'll it'll get to him and he'll he'll get back with me on because i know he's real familiar with uh, ted worms work uh, and this and the the photo that I showed there was a Ted Worm photo, and uh, so maybe somebody has some some uh, enough information to write a short, you know, a one page article on on the thing. Bill, this is where you're supposed to pipe up and say in regard to Fran's work. See, this is why. 3D printing is so nice because you can do it again with only minor mods instead of having to build it from scratch. And and if your hands aren't steady enough, you can probably you can probably get that flat rivet in. And my hand my my mouse might be shaking, but I'll I'll get it eventually without having to <laughs> remove paint. <laughs> uh, I, I actually threw a link up there, a couple of links on Auto Track. This is uh share this. This is actually a pretty interesting article um about carrying oh. autos in boxcars i think you can kind of see that concept of the 
how they were raising the cars up and putting four cars into a box car. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. So, and so those are is, the Evans loaders. Yeah, those are I think that's those are the Evans loaders inside a box car. And you kind of see here are loading cars in the side and this kind of goes through a lot of the concepts of it. And then the beginning of doors on the ends and loading them individually on the ends. And anyway, I, there's a link to that and another link in the chat. So if there's interest, uh, like I said, it'd be great to have a clinic about that and go through the, the concepts because it's one of those examples of people trying to uh, uh, do a better job of something that was pretty inefficient initially. It was when labor was cheap yep. and the cost of labor was not the most critical factor. I just look at that setup and the way the men are working and I'm think, boy, I bet there were some interesting injuries in that yeah. in that workplace. So I was gonna say no workman's comp. That's right. Yeah. Ugh. If you are paying people fifty cents an hour, what? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I also threw up uh, the uh, Wikipedia article articles on uh, auto racks, which covers a broad range of ways people put uh, cars on trains. And I uh, found that that's also an interesting reference. I don't know that I'm going to have a uh, a place for my 19, late 1980s uh, era uh, dream layout. I don't know whether I'm going to have a, a place where uh, auto racks are unloaded on a smaller scale like say in reno there's you know a few places where they've got the ramp that they can roll up or like in uh, bellin new mexico for example if anybody looks at the bellin new mexico virtual rail fan camera across the way you can see they have one of the ramps that they can bring up to a auto rack to unload it so i think that you don't have to have a gigantic facility to model modern uh, automobile unloading, if you're sort of out and away from the big cities, there may still be a chance to model that. But I'm, I'm toying with the idea of whether I want to include that on my, my layout in the future. One thing I've been alluding to, um, information news, um, is, is that PECO in England has started manufacturing ET scale track that is a uh, true 120th scale, mm. which means that it fits both the US version of TT and the European, not the English version of TT. Um, but it, the track is, is, is designed along their general lines of, of European North American style rail rather than the English. 120. And if you really want to get into something that it's halfway between halfway between H O and N at one one hundred and twentieth. I'm sure Richard Brennan can hook you up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most of us are going bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. Oh, you know, I I. Back around 2000, I was actually into F scale, which was is 120 to 0.3. It's it's taking the the, the gauge that that uh, was popularized for for G scale, and actually using correct scale um, mm. uh, factors to 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 build stuff, which makes it a lot bigger than the 124th or or whatever. It was G scale. Um, now that's narrow gauge, Ken. Is that is it yeah? It was narrow, narrow gauge. Well, modeling? no, that's FN three is narrow gauge. There were right. very few people who actually did standard gauge kits for um, one twentieth scale. Mm. Uh, if you want to talk about big, <laughs> the next thing is ride on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but oh. but the. 20th, uh, it, 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 it was, it's an interesting scale. I built a, a few of the Carter Brothers uh, kits and things like that. Carter Brothers cars as kits. It was hard right. for them to make the kits. 
again a different topic uh, for the September 25th. Should I put in my soldering clinic as one possibility? I think it'd have to be a little later than that. Uh, I'm talking the 25th event down in the South Bay, September 25th. Phil? Yeah, uh, I, I, I won't be won't be able to do it by then. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, Ken. I'm missing. Uh, I'm missing saying things correctly. Can't Phil at home, do you hear me? Oh, Pat Foley. Okay. Phil, you're muted. Yeah, I muted myself. That'd be. I think that'd be reasonable. Does that make sense to the folks here? A soldering clinic and on the 25th. This would be uh, an upgrade of the one you guys. Some of you were unfortunate enough to see here on this Zoom meeting, and I would. Um, do it, you know, that's something I could do there and have people do even some hands-on. I could dig up some of my I, I spare soldering be, irons. I think that'd be great. All um, right. We could set that up. I mean, one of the things we could do is set that up in the boardroom for, you know, a smaller group of people then and do more of a, you know, we could do more of a presentation clinic in the uh, main room, that, that clinic in the boardroom, and then do a couple of outdoor clinics for more scenery. I think that gives us kind of a range of of some hands-on things. Yeah, because I, I, I have to figure out where I have them stashed, but I've got a bunch of soldering irons and uh, I'm going to just set up some stations and samples and have people show them, show people and have people do it. Does anybody else in would be interested in that sort of clinic yeah. down the South Bay thing? Sure. There's Ken, okay. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll I'll go with that as a uh, one of the six things for September 25th and uh, Phil. I have to now get ready. We're taking uh, Susan's dad uh, up for an event in Oakland, and I have to start to get my uh, poop organized for that. So I'm going to uh, start to get ready to head out of here. But Phil, next week, I thought what I might share is for um, the group is what I've done for simple scenery, backdrop scenery for my uh, shelf layout that's down in the garage. I'll uh, take the iPad and take it downstairs and show you guys what I've done to hide some terrible looking things and give a impression of a backdrop, if you will. Cool. Yeah, I, um, let's see. That'll be on the, the six, it's the 16th. 16th. All right. Yeah. And I, I actually had talked to, to Edwin, Edwin Hall, Ed Hall about reprising his, his, um, airbrush clinics, airbrush clinic from the, um, PCR convention that day as well. So didn't I he thought, cancel that clinic? I thought he canceled it because I was going to go to it. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, if he did, then that would be an opportunity to see it. So yes. So yeah, I'd, I'd it, like that. I, I thought that would be a great way to have uh, folks. So like I said, I've had four. Oh my God! I love the way Dave walks right into the oncoming train. <laughs> The backdrop is, you just got smaller and smaller, and it looked like you were just stepping right onto the train itself. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so uh, Phil, when, on the airbrushing one, did you have a date set, or you're just, it's a potential? Mute it again. I, I had just suggested to him two weeks from today, but we'll talk about it. We'll schedule it either then or the next one. All right. Cool. One of these days, I'll get together my, my clinic on how to paint without an airbrush. Good one. Uh, so I'm going to go and take care of family stuff. You gentlemen all have a fine two weeks before I uh, see you again. And uh, I'll talk to Larry. Uh, to try to hammer out some more details about 
20, 21 August. Uh, I'm leaving both those days open because I have to see what the Golden Gate people are comfortable with because I don't want to push them. And then we'll go from there. I'm going to have to take a moment also and leave because I have to deliver my grandson's crib to a close friend. So we got to take this thing apart and move it. So everybody also have a wonderful couple of weeks. And I'll look forward to do the YouTube to see your presentation, Bill. Excellent. Okay. Bye, all. Cool. Well, if everybody's comfortable, I'm just going to go ahead and, and click into this clinic. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep. Anybody uh, got anything else to, to cover? Otherwise, I'll take a, a breath and then go ahead and share screen and start. So. So welcome. So this is a this is a reprise of a clinic that was from the uh, Pacific Coast region um, convention that was uh, in April of 2022 uh, up in Roarner Park. Um, and this is a, uh, a clinic I put together about kind of a bit of a journey and it's a two dimensional journey. One is a, a journey in terms of um, building modules and how the scenery and location of modules was determined. And also a bit of trying to move from modules being more what I'll call um, run trains around in circles modules to being more operationally focused. Um, so uh, kind of the thought process here is this is part of the California Central Coast. Um, it's the modular group I'm sure most folks are familiar with. Um, a couple of pictures here of some different shows that the, the club has done. Um, you know, it's typically 10 to 12 members. Chuck, Chuck who's on here is actually, uh, Chuck Moronis, who's on is a member. Um, basically have 10 to 12 active members. Uh, the modules are generally owned individually, um, though we have a number of club modules as well. So it's, it's really a combination thereof. Um, typical event is, you know, as small as 10, typically 30 modules. Um, we do an event in Roaring Camp. We've had up to, I think, about 50 modules at times. Um, we actually had started to try some operations as a group. Um, and we were planning on hosting the operations on demand at the Concord Convention. And that was supposed to be in 2020. Um, we'll look at potentially reprising that in 2024. Um, one of the things that Earl and I've talked about is having that something like that, either this group or another group at the 2024 convention. Uh, one of the things that happened in 2018 was we had essentially two members um, who had a reasonably large number of well-detailed modules, um, came to all the events, or not all the events, but most of the events. And because of health issues, it became clear that they were no longer going to be able to participate. Um, so with that in mind, we began to say, let's you know, look at doing some new modules. So uh, one of the things we decided out of that was that we needed to have some just basic four foot modules. So I started building some modules, uh, started with four, with three four foot modules. Um, and as I built them, it actually turned out that it began to change kind of the focus. Um, the first of those three modules was actually built using Woodland Scenics, um, Woodland Scenics buildings. I actually have a picture here of it. Um, it had the Woodland Scenics gas station and the Woodland Scenics house um, with a rail, rail crossing. And it was kind of a nice generic module of, you know, a little crossing and, and gas station. Um, as begin to look at the next module, one of the things I decided I wanted to do was build a hill um, with a tunnel and decided that a tunnel was really um, on a modular layout where it's open and you can kind of see the trains everywhere, having occasionally a tunnel to have the train disappear and divide the scenery thought was very advantageous. Um, so started looking for a place to build a tunnel. And that brought me to the module that's here on the left, the Mission Hill in Santa Cruz. Um, that's a two by four foot module. Um, the tunnel is basically 19 inches instead of 90, 907 feet. Um, but it really is intended to be a module that replicated kind of the look and feel of the Mission Hill Tunnel, which still runs through Mission Hill and Santa Cruz. This was actually where 
in um, in the late late 1800s, they moved the railroad tracks from going through the downtown streets in Santa Cruz. The the city said you got to get your tracks out of here. They couldn't do a cut in the hill because the Mission San Jose was on top, so they did a tunnel through the hill. Um, and it seemed to me that was kind of an ideal prototype model. And that actually began kind of a change of saying, instead of just doing generic scenery, let's pick a prototype scenery and try to use that. Um, the other thing, the second module on the right is Wilder Ranch. Um, this was kind of driven by wanting to do a, uh, a stockyard. I, I bought the band, a stockyard kit. And as I looked around, I found Wilder Ranch. Um, if you haven't been to Wilder Ranch, it's a uh, now a state park just north of Santa Cruz. Um, if you go there, or you park in the parking lot, there's like a visitor center, and then you can walk down the road down the hill to the original Wilder Ranch. If you haven't been there, it's actually very interesting. Um, it was actually a creamery back in the 1800s, early 1900s, and they actually built the, the shed, the barn, for the cows for the creamery across a uh, creek that runs to the ocean. So they had this kind of idealized thing where they fed the cows and all the cow uh, outcome dropped into the creek and flowed to the ocean underneath. Um, if you actually go to the parking lot and you park in the parking lot and walk towards the ocean, you'll actually go down a little hill and you'll come to the main, the railroad tracks and the siding there that used to be there. So when I found that, I said, gee, there probably would have been up here some facilities for rail transport when they actually had a siding here. So that created the idea of a little creamery building to store the cream and cheese that they would ship on a daily basis. And then a little stockyard there for shipping cows in and out. Because clearly if it was a dairy farm, um, they maybe would be shipping some animals in, but would probably be shipping some of the male steers out that were um, the progeny of the uh, of the cows that were there. Um, so this led to the concept of building a, a new module that was bigger and more operationally focused. The problem with these three modules was they had one siding out of three modules. So if you think about that from 12 feet of modular length in a layout, there was only one siding. Um, so I actually began the concept of a new module. Um, Typically six feet is about all you can do in a module. Um, longer than that, it's hard to transport it. Um, I find six feet fits pretty well in a lot of vehicles. Um, I did the width of these modules at two feet, four inches because my storage area where I store these in a game room and it has a sliding glass door to go into it and it's a six foot sliding glass door. And when you open a six foot sliding glass door, you get about two foot five, two foot six inches of, of actual door opening. So assuming a little bit of accoutrements on the sides of the modules, um, two foot four was actually the, uh, the width that was dictated. Uh, from an operations perspective, one of the things I really wanted to do is have a number of car spots. Um, so within that 12 feet, wanted to find something that had, you know, a, a reasonable amount of potential switching from an operations perspective as a location to run a train to and do some local switching. Um, wanted to have a long runaround siding. One of the challenges is um, we tend to have shorter runaround sidings, which allows you to only have relatively short trains. And then from, a, from an operations perspective, wanted to have both leading and trailing point switching. Um, from a scenery perspective, I wanted some form of harbor scene, um, a wharf and a pier, a fishing dock. Um, Frenchman, Frenchman River Model Works has a four-car ON30 barge that I kind of fell in love with and decided that I really wanted to have one of those and wanted to have a boat and ship. And finally, wanted to focus on California um, coast scenery, not New England. Um, if you look at most of the what I'll call for lack of a word of small harbor modules that we see in model railroading, they tend to reflect New England up to Maine kind of modeling versus what we saw in California, which was typically a lot later and, and quite frankly, a lot more industrial versus kind of the, uh, the small towns that you see on the East Coast. Um, so with that in mind, I started doing some designing. Um, this was the first design I came up with. Um, kind of came in with the idea that you've got a bridge over here on the, the, the right coming in. You see the crossing siding. 
Um, had then off of that a siding coming down that went to both the pier and the um, and the barge. Um, because these came down at the same level, one of the big disadvantages was that the pier and the barge were almost at the same level from a track perspective, which was not necessarily what you really wanted for the uh, from a scenery perspective. Um, I actually reviewed this at an LD SIG event with the LD SIG team, and, and the comments that came back were really around the idea of this switchback and how unrealistic that really was, that a real railroad would not have ever done this where you had to come down and come over here to switch this side um, and vice versa. Um, and then it also had a straight passing siding um, and it was pretty cramped and crowded. So kind of went back to the drawing board and started really playing with alternatives. And at some point there was an epiphany um, and that's what I find is generally if you have a problem if you kind of just play with it a while, an epiphany occurs and the epiphany second design came out of that epiphany and that epiphany was let's put the barge on one side of the module and the pier on the other side of the module what this allowed me to do was keep the pier at the higher level of the track of this track through the module right here because this could all be at the same level where now i could have a fairly steep de in decline incline down to this barge which could be at a lower level so when you kind of look at this what it says is now this could be up at say a couple of inches and this could be an inch and a half inch and three quarters lower um, on the other side um, i thought this was a pretty great design i'm pretty happy with it um, but what i did then and this is actually an interesting again thought process of how you can go through some of these design processes is I went to the RIOPS industrial um, SIG on groups.io and I put up a, um, a kind of a, a discussion of what I was doing, some of the pictures that you see here and asked for feedback. Um, what was very interesting was I got about 30 comments and suggestions. Um, the post is still up there if you want to go look if you're part of the, uh, this group in groups.io um, and they were really good suggestions. Um, really saying, you know, what you've done here really is great, but here are some comments. And in the end, those comments really came down to two major comments. Um, the first comment from a track perspective was, you're going to need idlers for your flat down at your car float to pull the cars on and off the car float because you can't have engines out here on this area. Um, where are you going to store those idlers? Because the plan at this point would have been that the idlers would have had to been stored somewhere up here and would have had to have been picked up and taken back and forth each time you pulled a car off of the car float or bloated a car onto the car float. Um, the second comment was really good, which was, why don't you move this switch from here instead of tying off of this lead track here? Why don't you move this switch directly onto the main or siding track here that runs through instead of putting a switch it would make things simpler open things up a bit and to my mind both of those became really good comments and and i found that this was a great way to get comments about what you should do there was actually a really interesting challenge if you notice at the top here this is called lichen landing um i did that just lichen being what you put on the layout i didn't really have any idea it was it was at that point considered to be kind of a generic um, harbor on the California coast. Uh, one of the questions that came back, because clearly from the, the RIOPS folks more prototypically focused is, well, where is this? Um, so that actually then drove me to saying, well, this is how it's gonna be as built. But as I got into that, I'd have been to look at where is this located? So I kind of let me talk real quickly about what, what it is as built and, and kind of why it turned out to be pretty good. You'll notice that one of the things that I did when I went to the as built here from, I'm gonna go back to the first one. On the first one, I had two tracks on the, um, on the pier and that just turned out to be too much in terms of width. So by the time I got to the as built, I'd had the pier was now a single track on this side, and then a track on this side, which could sort could, could um, service this building, which now became a warehouse. Um, 
this building, one of the things I wanted to do is have a building with a car inside of it. I just thought that was a, a cool feature to have in terms of interest. Um, so this became a transfer and shipping. And then I wanted to have a cannery. And I'll show you some pictures in a little while. I found this thing called the Standard Oil, Standard Oil Fuel Pier, which was in Monterey, and wanted to model that. So what this ended up doing was I was able to build the, the layout, the modules with the tracks at track height. The water is down about two and a quarter inches below the track height. And then there's a 4% downgrade from, the, uh, from this upper level that drops an inch and a half down to the car float. So the car floats about three quarters of an inches. The track level is about three quarters of an inch above the water level here at the car float. So this was the idea of kind of building the module, but in, in doing this, I began to say, you know, where could this be? And I, I've always liked Moss Landing. It's a place we've take, gone down to, we go through, we take the dogs to the beach. And as I looked at Moss Landing, I began to realize that Moss Landing had really changed through the years. Um, so if you look at, at Moss Landing, this was actually what Moss Landing looked like over here on the left in 1914. Um, it turns out this, this Moho Co down here was actually the original river path. And the original river flowed out through Moss Landing to the ocean. This was the Salinas River. In 1906, when the earthquake happened, the river actually relocated and exited about five miles south down the coast, which meant Moss Landing silted up in 1906. And from 1906 to 1947, it, Elkhorn Slough was essentially closed to the ocean. Um, in 1947, as part of a post-war activity to build more harbors on the West Coast, for our, ostensibly for shipping, but also just to have more facilities, they actually dredged this open and dredged the channel and Moss Landing began to open up. And what you see here is what Moss Landing looks like today. This is obviously the big power plant over here, but this is now a, a harbor and uh, used primarily for fishing. So as I looked at this, I said, well, what if this harbor had actually been dredged in 1910 to 1915, right after um, it was silted in? Would that have enabled a way to think about a, uh, a, different, um, a different way of, of building, of building the, uh, a, a different location? So what that ended up bringing was, a, I think, a pretty cool potential prototype, though a bit imagineered. So this was actually the, the narrow gauge railroad that went through the area. Um, you'll notice it comes from the north. This was the railroad built by, by Spreckles. Um, and it actually comes down here, comes across right here. And then on this side, it actually had a railroad that went across and out to where there was a wharf. Um, and if you go there today, you'll actually see this side right here is actually still the road bridge that's there and actually still in place. And this bridge is actually, there's a bridge about in this location today. So this actually ties into the Paro Valley Railroad. Um, the Par Paro Valley Railroad was established by Charles Spreckles um, when he built his beet processing plants and really was a narrow gauge railroad that ran from Watsonville in the north quite a ways down to the south. Uh, so what, it, what was interesting was when I looked at this and said, okay, if you look at where these tracks are running along here, what would happen if we actually took what I was building and designing as a module and laid it out right along the water there? So again, assuming that the channel was dredged and because the channel was dredged, that now let ships come in. If this area was dredged, you now could have, you know, the fuel dock, a cannery, a pier, the storage and the uh, sea and land supply, it was still called at this point, right aligned here along the waterway. So this now gave me a reason to say, well, this could have actually been located here if in fact you uh, had had this dredged in 1910 to 1915. On the other side, because there's no power plant here, obviously, um, we could have run a track over here to a barge and, and including a backstory of why you would have a barge there 
to service an area that had a washout and the track couldn't go to it. So really what this did was allow me to now take the module here shown on the right and position it in a way that could have actually existed if in fact it had been built in this area at that time. Uh, the other thing that this let me do is it let me actually have about 12 spots um, on the layout to spot to. So there are four spots down here on the, uh, on the barge. There are a couple of spots over here. And then there are a number of spots here on the, uh, on the pier and behind this building and inside here of this building. So it really kind of had, had let me have a location, but what that really did was let me now say, how can I make the modules that I build on this layout follow what would now be a realistic prototype and a focused area? Uh, one of the things I found that was really interesting out of this discussion was that we had a, um, we had, if you look at the, the area, in 1906, when the earthquake happened, there was a lot of damage down in this area. When that, when that damage happened, they did something that really never happened, which is they took pictures of things that were unimportant. Um, industrial buildings, a lot of those things tended to be fairly unimportant. In fact, the bottom right picture here is one of the few pictures I have that is actually of Moss Landing uh, circa this time frame. And if you, you look at this picture, this is a picture that's actually taken from the ocean side of the sandbar, looking back across towards the land side. So these were actually warehouses that were there at Moss Landing. Um, this track right here, the far end of this track is where the Y is. And if you look over here on the upper left, this is actually the, looking the opposite direction. So this picture on the upper left is taken right here looking back this way and you see a picture looking out towards the ocean this is the railroad bridge this is the road bridge and over here in this area these are actually the warehouses and things that are adjacent to the pier um, or the wharf that they built this is actually a picture the center picture is a picture of the wharf um, you can see the buildings that were there collapsed in the earthquake um, and you can see actually here's some pile drivers for extending the wharf um, this was another picture of a collapsed building a little bit farther back. Um, and I threw in a picture of the current area um, with an Amtrak train going through it. So you see the trains still go through the area there. Um, so that kind of said, well, gee, I now have an interesting area to model. And if I look at the buildings that are there, I can begin to think about modeling those buildings based on, on their structure. The other thing was that I wanted to have a cannery. Um, it's kind of a, a very prototypical um, California coastal thing in the area with Monterey there and, and obviously the, the cannery row, et cetera. Um, so I started looking for some canneries and ended up finding um, the cannery that you see here kind of in, the, in this picture and this picture and this picture, which was the Hobden cannery. Hobden was one of the leaders in, in canning and Moss Landing in, in the uh, sardine era, um, a leader in a lot of the technology. It turns out what's interesting is that the Hovden cannery was actually the prototype that they used to design the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So one of the things that's interesting is this building is actually fairly evocative of the, the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So that was kind of my pick was to say, let's choose the cannery there and, and build a cannery in that way. The, uh, the other thing that I found as again, I was looking at a lot of photo, so prototype photos and looking at things that were interesting was this idea of a fueling pier. So this is the standard oil fueling pier. Um, I actually have an aerial photograph I didn't include here. This was actually kind of a stub off of the main pier in Monterey. So the picture that you're seeing here, this large picture is actually taken from the main pier and you can kind of see there's a little side pier that comes out here. And then there's the standard oil pier here. Um, turns out that a lot of the uh, very large Italian families that were the fishermen in Monterey, when they had a, a, either a new boat or had some other a, a occasion for a celebration, they would invite all their families on and they would take them fishing. Um, when they tied up at the pier to actually uh, fill up for that trip, was a great time to take pictures. So there are a lot of pictures of 
of ships at the pier. So this is the standard oil pier that, that is there and in, in, was there in Monterey. Um, so the first thing I decided to do is I needed to design a warehouse. So because this was based on Spreckles and what Spreckles was doing was he was actually um, shipping raw sugar from the sugar beet refinery up to the processing facility that was up in Martinez. Um, so when Spreckles actually started in the sugar business, he was growing sugar cane in Hawaii. They would process the sugar cane to raw sugar in Hawaii, ship the raw sugar to San Francisco, and then the plant in San Francisco would do the final processing either into white sugar or whatever sugar they wanted to ship to customers. So basically, if you, if you look at this, the idea was to create a warehouse where we could, I could ship, design the concept of shipping sugar. Um, so this was a, a basic, it's 20 inches by eight inches. And again, if you look at it, you'll see that it really does reflect um, the, view, the design of these warehouses here. Um, kind of long, low slung, low roofs, um, fairly low walls. And then on one side, having a bit of a, uh, a projected, um, um, building out. So this design kind of reflected that. Um, then the second building was the transfer warehouse. Um, that was actually designed to, to have a car go inside. Um, it turns out I changed the roof, the roof from being this direction to the other direction when I finally built it. Um, but it basically died of designing a, a building there. The third building is the cannery. Um, the cannery, again, is actually a bit designed after the Hovden cannery. And what I'm trying to do here is combine the three elements in, that you would see in a cannery facility into a single building. Um, so this little projection out here to the left is kind of the offices. Um, that was in the picture you saw was kind of to the right of the doorway. Um, then you have kind of this main building right here that is a powerhouse. And the idea to have a couple of boilers in there, because that's what they had was the boilers to boil steam, to seal the cans. And then finally, this room down here, which was intended to be the fish processing room. So the idea is I could actually have the three elements of the cannery in, in a relatively compressed space. Um, clearly, actually modeling a cannery would take a lot more space than was available on the module. Um, so this is basically building the module. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but um, the module construction is, is uh, what we use in the CCC. It's, it's done with a, a face frame, um, Luan, Luan plywood for in between, and then half inch plywood for the sides and the ends. Um, you notice what I did was actually, because I knew I was gonna use um, this two and a half inches or, of foam, um, which you can see here, the, the depth on the side here, of how thick it is from where the rail height will be down to where the water level is. Um, decided to put both the buildings and the turnouts, the electrical turnouts, which were tortoises, into boxes. Um, the reason for putting the buildings in was I wanted to make the buildings removable for transport. Um, it's fairly hard on these things to actually put, it, put a... a a uh, module with details and a trailer. So I thought I had to be able to remove the buildings. Um, the turnouts, because there was gonna be about two and a half inches of foam um, going from the bottom up, felt that having the turnout throw through that distance was gonna be a challenge. So everywhere there was an electrical turnout, there's a little box built. And the idea is that the turnouts now mount up in those boxes. Um, after that was done, everything was covered with foam. Uh, you know, it's used Woodland Scenics here for the ramp down to the, uh, down to the barge. Um, where you see raw plywood, that's actually water. Add in another quarter inch piece of plywood there um, to give a half inch thickness to make sure it had enough rigidity that didn't have any issues with the water later cracking. Um, so that was the basics of, of the module. Um, one thing I did there on the, the basic module now was done with home bed. Um, it's not really, I don't think it's available any longer. Microengineering tracks. Um, one of the things that did here that's actually very good from a modular perspective 
because these two modules will always clip together. Uh, actually use gap masters and everything is glued and aligned perfectly with alignment pins so you can just clip them together. Um, and then when that was done, basically everything was covered with sculpt mold um, I really like sculpt molds You can buy a 10 pound bag from uh, Scenery Express and it turns out for a module like this, about five pounds of sculpt mold will cover both modules with a thin layer. Um, it's much better than having raw foam because if people push on raw foam, it cracks, um, it distorts your, your scenery. Um, if you'll notice where the joint is was actually done with wax paper in between pushing the sculpt mold up against the wax paper. So this is actually the joint line and it's not quite invisible, but it's pretty close to being invisible when you look at it. Um, so this is just a couple of pictures. This is the electrical um, on the bottom. You'll see the feeder wires coming in that feed through. These are actually the main track power bus feeding through the module. And then there's a, a circuit with a light bulb over to the module bus wires. Um, and then you'll notice these are the tortoises. You'll see they're in those little boxes. So they're actually um, raised up. And that had another advantage of if the tortoises had been mounted at this level, they would have been actually come below the deck of the, uh, of the module here. By recessing them, they were lower. Um, the other thing is that these are all equipped with RJ45 jacks. So the uh, plug in to the electronics is just with an RJ45 right here. Um, and these are the, uh, the uh, Wabbits, um, which is a, uh, a DCC based switch. Um, the reason I use these is that they actually have a feature where they will switch back to normal when you, um, that you can define a normal and a divergent route. And you can set a timer where after 30 seconds or 40 seconds, it will automatically switch back to the normal route, which if you think about it from the perspective of a module is really important because we tend to occasionally forget to switch the turnouts back the public talks to us and that can create a, a head-on collision. Um, so basically this, this next picture is, um, I don't have the sound turned on, but this was actually a, uh, a view of actually operating on it. This is the point where everything was operating together. And in fact, this was uh, actually submitted as a golden spike video. Um, so you can kind of see there's one engine running at the end and another engine running from here. Um, so the next stages was to now complete out the buildings um, and the building locations. The buildings are actually done with a piece of plywood that fits into the frame here with a piece of masonite on top. And my thought process was to build the buildings on the masonite, making it really easy to remove them and put them in on the module. Um, you can kind of see the water here has all been painted, um, kind of got all of the, uh, the ground scenery in place and kind of putting things together. Um, so I put a few evolving construction detail slides in. I uh, thought those might be of some interest. Um, and part of this is really a change in my thought process of how to build buildings. So my first thought, and I thought this was a really interesting concept, was to build the buildings out of acrylic. Um, using eighth inch acrylic, you have a very strong building structure. Again, these were designed to be picked up and taken off the layout, put back on the layout. Um, I went and looked at acrylic, said, Geo could do this, it's self glazing. And so I actually built all three buildings out of acrylic. You can kind of see the construction here. Um, they were actually all cut out on a combination of a table saw and uh, one of these little scroll saws I've had for years. And that actually gave me three buildings that were made out of acrylic. So. What you see here is the transfer building right here, the larger one with the tracks that go inside. This is the warehouse building next to it, that one that you saw with, the, uh, with that peak side roof. And this is the cannery over here. You can see the, uh, the main cannery building here, kind of a little extension out here. And this would be the, uh, the fish processing part of the cannery building. Um, so I thought this was a great idea. Um, decided to start with the, the transfer building. It was the smallest of the three, felt it was a great place to start. So my original strategy on this construction was 
to basically cover the building using epoxy. And this is just board and batten siding. Um, so board and batten siding was glued on with epoxy on the outside. Um, this is just scribe siding on scribe siding here on the inside. Um, after it was after the siding was glued on, it was finished. Um, kind of detailed, a little bit of roughness to it. And you kind of see the construction here. I, in order to match the height of the floor to the tracks that had been installed, um, it turned out it was just about exactly the right height to put a piece of acrylic there. So I put acrylic on the floor and then I wanted a couple of tracks to run out to the door. So those were actually just ACC directly onto the acrylic. And then on top of that acrylic, again, put um, scribe siding as the flooring. So you can kind of see uh, see what this looks like here with the flooring in, um, the tracks, et cetera. And then on the inside, I started putting in um, essentially framing on the inner walls so you can see through it. Um, one of the things that did was took the windows and sanded the backs of the windows so they were actually smooth to the, uh, the mullions here on these closer in windows and then glued those in place. And you kind of see here, even though it's eighth inch acrylic that's behind that plex uh, behind those, uh, those tissue castings, it actually doesn't look bad when you look at it. And actually when you physically look at it, it's pretty good. Um, I had printed, done the roof and the roof was actually done with acrylic. Um, it was glued together as two pieces that had some gussets here to hold it in place. So it was actually done as a unit, but I decided I wanted some trusses. And so I have a 3D printer and I said, well, let's 3D print some trusses, um, 3D printed some trusses, cut some paper gussets out, did some weathering and they don't look too bad because you don't see them that much when you look into the building. Um, added on some strips with some lights. Um, one of the things that is kind of neat about this building is um, I drilled a hole and put a wire piece of copper wire around each of the gussets on the ends, which you'll notice were made very tight to the walls to hold it in place. And then I put a little brass shoe here on the top of the wall. And this actually brass rod runs down through to the bottom and actually then connects to a wire. So when you drop the roof in, these two wires slide against, the, uh, against this plate and actually connect the lights up. So the lights connect up automatically. Um, so in the end, kind of as I built this, I decided, you know, it really didn't look that bad. Um, if you look at the pictures here, this again, the looking through the windows looks pretty good. Um, down here are some pictures of the inside. This is the framing that was put on the interior walls. The, the only place you really see this is right here where you can kind of see how thick the walls are. Um, decided, and that really kind of began to bother me as I looked at this. And as I looked at it, I began to realize that, you know, it really wasn't necessary to just do the 3D for the roof. What if you did the warehouse using 3D printing? So this was actually the um, epiphany, so to speak, that led to doing um, a warehouse with through a 3D printed, pr printed framing. So this was the next one that I ended up building. These are a couple of pictures of it. Um, did a clinic on this separately, so don't have a lot here on that. But um, what you see here is a building that is all the framing is 3D printed, but the out exterior walls, the siding, et cetera, are all the normal natural materials we might model with. So what it ends up being is a very strong structural, structural building, but that actually has great appearance. Um, so kind of to close today, um, this is kind of how the module looks. I've gotten a little bit more work done since the convention, but uh, quite frankly, not as much as I wanted. Um, the warehouse building is pretty much complete. I need to put some details in it. I was waiting for the narrow gauge convention to buy some details for it. Um, you can kind of see it here. Um, the transfer building, I need to put the roof on it. And I've actually started that since this picture was taken. Um, I have a little, I have a little kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, cabin or house here. Um, the intent is to have a little dock out here with a rowboat in this area. Um, and you can see down here at the bottom, this is kind of a picture of the modules together um, as a unit um, in, my, uh, in my storage room. 
Um, on the other end of the module, we have the fuel pier. Um, this is the, the fuel pier building. Um, it's got a building on it. I'm actually doing this building right now. Um, also as a 3D printed framed building. Um, this is actually the barge, uh, an excellent kit. This is a resin kit, goes together really well. Um, combination of the barge and the ramp for the barge. And then you see over here, the, um, the, this is the edge, edge of the, uh, the cannery building there, which is still in acrylic. Um, and this is the standard, the standard oil fuel pier, um, trying to kind of capture that same look of, you know, a fuel pier, some sort of a fuel dock, but obviously I wanted to have a railroad um, facility to be able to have a tank car delivering fuel. That's not very realistic and not very prototypical. Um, I did find a smaller fishing boat. Um, this was one of the challenges. When I looked at the fishing boats in Monterey, it turns out that most of them were actually fairly large, but I did find some smaller boats. Um, but one of the things that I found was that almost all of the boats in the West Coast were done with a fly bridge. Um, it turns out the most of the models for fishing boats are East Coast boats. And I guess in the Atlantic Ocean, you really don't want to ever be on a fly bridge. That's the difference between uh, fishing in Monterey Bay where it's nice weather and on the East Coast. So um, what I actually did was took a, um, a fishing boat that came again from French Run um, River Model Works, but added on a styrene um, fly bridge to the top of it um, to make it, it fit better. Um, some pictures of the barge and tug. Um, I have a tug, the tug, I'm, I'm actually in the process right now of finishing both the fishing boat and the tug. Those, that's the project I'm working on the workbench right now on. Hopefully I have something to show in a couple of weeks. Um, but you can kind of see the barge here and the, uh, the loading dock and, and how everything comes together. Um, and then we also have built a, a station and a house, um, found a sidetrack laser Garibaldi depot kit. Um, this has a bit of personal um, um, connection. My parents lived on, in Bay City, which is the little town between Garibaldi and um, Tillamook up on the Tillamook Bay in Oregon. That was their summer place for a number of years in their retirement. Um, and this was actually a model of the Southern Pacific Garibaldi Depot, which actually was a standard Southern Pacific design of what I, <laughs> I understand to be a flat car transportable um, depot. So have no fat, it actually has printed interiors. The, I did the um, using printed interiors for a uh, printed being paper printed interiors for, for that building. And then next to it, you see the little little house, little house at the end, really trying to make one decrepit building on the way out. So kind of a uh, close on some learnings. Um, I think finding prototypes for inspiration is transformative. Um, this has taken a lot longer than I thought. Um, turns out COVID kind of slowed things down more than I thought. I, it's hard to keep focused when you have no goals. Um, and COVID took away goals for about two years. Um, the next steps, I need to complete the pier, um, warehouse and transfer area. Um, I was intending to get started on this that this week. Um, quite frankly, last, last week was my last formal work event. So my uh, focus was to focus on retirement, but unfortunately COVID kind of interfered over the past week. Um, I need to decide how to build the cannery. Um, at this point, I'm trying to decide whether to keep the acrylic building for this part of the building, which is actually, um, if you look at the original construction, was a concrete post and beam with concrete blocks in between. <laughs> so I need to figure out how to do that and how to complete this building. Um, I need to build a water tower. And then I need to just do the foliage and, of course, a whole bunch of water. Um, big challenge with the water is I have a four foot edge on it and getting that water tight to pour, pour water will be a challenge. And then details, details, and more details. Um, I was very successful at Oskel West in buying, I think I spent about $150 on boxes of details and that actually was great. Um, and then of course the narrow gauge convention up in Spokane or in, um, in uh, Seattle in, um, the end of the summer. 
So that was um, the the uh, clinic. Any questions, comments, um, et cetera? I had a question. I had a question. Uh, great job. <laughs> Very impressive. Uh, in the sequence of slides, I think you were moving from the transfer building uh, to the warehouse. I'm not sure, but uh, on the interior shot, it looked like there was a diamond crossing in there where the one track intersected another and there was a- Oh, box. yes. Um, hang on, let me, uh, let me go over here. Um, hang on, let me pull back to it. I, I have a picture of that when it was being built. Um, there we go. Hang on. Let me share share my screen again. Yeah. So so this is what you're referring to right here. Oh yeah. So so uh, literally what this is. If you kind of look at this, this is just acrylic. This is the the same eighth inch acrylic that I used for the walls. And I just cut some strips and glued them on. And I find that epoxy works pretty well for this. So these were just epoxy down onto um, the underlying um, underlayment, which was, which was um, um, board. Uh, this is actually cut here for that wire. This is the wire that comes down is cut in here. These are just these are just code 70 rails that are glued directly on. I glued one directly onto the acrylic and then just used some you know rail gaps to glue the other one directly on and just ran them over here. So yeah, it's kind of a crossing, but not really. Um, the idea was here was more that you would have a I can create a little cart here to carry things out onto the pier. I thought it was just some interest for that. I see. Um, so that was not prototype. That was, yeah, this was more, much more freelance than prototype. This, this, this part here, it was, uh, um, yeah. So this is kind of, there's, you see what it looks like kind of looking in where you've got those tracks running over to the, the car, the cart there. Um, great job. Now. Thank you. So that that was was one clinic out of the way for us. So trying to make things more interesting. Any other questions, comments? No, that's great, Phil. Thank you. I'm amazed I got through that. I was kind of kind of getting a challenge there towards the end. You can kind of tell how long you get out of this after uh, after being a little sick. So. I have other friends that just got back from Florida and now they have the COVID too. Yeah, I think everybody in COVID, everybody in Florida has COVID from what I can tell. Mm -hmm. It's uh, unfortunate, but true. Yeah, I, I was surprised. I, sh I sure didn't expect it. So probably should have. Well, that kind of closes it from my perspective. Any um, anyone else have anything they'd like to to cover, or maybe we'll call it a week. Well, with that, I think I'll wish everybody adieu. Have a a great couple of weeks, and we'll see you uh, on the. Uh, the 16th in two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Enjoy. Enjoy.